promised land. So that was how the promised land became the bubble of land. Yeah, really. <laughs> what were you, what were we promised? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know how to get that off the screen, unfortunately. Okay. All right. This shouldn't give you any trouble if it does. Um, just take your cursor, click on a dead part of the presentation. It may click it forward, but it'll re-engage it. And we figured out what the problem was. And it's when we had more than one item in this USB port is when it would tell which one it is. That's right. That's right. And so that's why we move the presentation over and then eject also so you don't forget the, the um, thumb track. But okay, uh, we'll be on the other side of watching. Okay. okay, all right. This looks like this is it. Or should I wait? We've got a couple, we've got a few. We've actually, actually only had two people register for Zoom, good. but we do not know if they all decided to join us. Okay. 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 Uh, we might need to, if we can point the camera up just a little bit, we're cutting off his head, yeah, but make sure you need it. I am open, I think. Well, it's kickoff times. Uh, I'm supposed to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Flynn Warren, as it says up there. And I'm retired from UGA in pharmacy school. I've uh, been retired since 2007. Uh, now we're getting back on camera again. And um, I'm now retired and living in Decatur. We moved over there to be closer to kids. We have one daughter and one son that are now within five minutes each. So that helps a lot, as I'm sure many of you know. <laughs> um, Anyway, this one's going to be about Crawford Law, but there's four in the series, which you might be, hopefully you'd be interested in. The first one is Crawford Law. He's famous for ether anesthesia. Second one is Asa Candler, who's famous for Coca-Cola and Emory University. The third one is Ray Alquist, who if any of you are taking a beta blocker or any other drugs for hypertension, he's the man that came up and explained how all those drugs are going to work. Now, that's three pharmacists in Georgia who sort of, shall we say, impacted mankind with a little bit of what they did. Now, our fourth person's also been impacted by mankind as a pharmacy background, and that's Agatha Christie. She worked as a pharmacy assistant in hospitals in England in World War I and World War II. And, of course, her books, and so about Agatha Christie, it's about how she used drugs in her, in her uh, different things. But I'm originally from North Carolina. I went to a little school called Belmont Abbey for two years and then decided to go to pharmacy school at South Carolina uh, and got a bachelor's there, got a master's at Georgia. I uh, was on the faculty here from 1967 to 77 and from 1985 to 2007 when I retired. From 77 to 85, along with these two reprobates up here, I was in Saudi Arabia uh, at the King Faisal Specialist Hospital. Um, where we took care of ordinary Saudis, but also the royal family. So I got to go on a code on the king. Uh, he lived, fortunately. Uh, I've, been, <laughs> uh, I've been president of the Georgia Pharmacy Association, and basically I'm still licensed now for 59 years, but I don't work much at all anymore since, you know, I can't, who knows. But anyway, so we'll get started with Crawford. Back in the early days, this is like the surgeon and the anesthesiologist. <clears throat> Absolutely no drugs or anything, just a club to put them to sleep and a club to cut them apart. Wasn't much could be done. But the Egyptians didn't know how to do surgery. They were good at eye surgery. They could take out cataracts, for example. And trepanning, which is the name of this uh, hole in your skull, uh, that was done over 5,000 years ago probably to treat epilepsy or some other mental disease because they would have believed it would let the bad things out if you gave them a hole to go out of the brain through. So that would have been the logic behind it. And the hole shows that it healed. So therefore the patient had to survive this for that healing to have, to have occurred. Um, what anesthesia literally means is no sensation. 
means you don't feel anything done. And until we got anesthesia, surgery just was not that practical. Uh, you basically had to be fast. They could take off a leg in less than a minute. Uh, you also had to have people holding the patient down while you did that. Uh, so you had to have maybe six to eight people holding them down or have them strapped down or whatever. And they just had to tolerate the pain and the sounds of surgery. If you were ever awake during a knee replacement or anything like that, it sounds like they're you know tearing up the street uh, with, the, with the noise it makes, far worse than anything dentists ever do to you. If you really want to read what it was like on a personal basis, this lady is shown in the picture here, Frances Fanny Burney, who lived from 1752 to 1840. She had a cancerous breast taken off with no anesthesia now in 1811. And she has written a very accurate description of what it felt like to her as it was happening. And so that's an example of what a patient had to go through to have it done. There is a book you might want to try to find called The Butchering Art. And it takes uh, does a try to do a good job of explaining what surgery was like in the early days. Now, this one is basically about Lister and the battle of feet to defeat infection. But they do credit off uh, Crawford Long as being the first person to use ether for surgical anesthesia. Uh, but they describe well about uh, Lister and carbolic acid. And that in itself was its own battle in surgery. Americans particularly just did not want to believe Lister. Uh, the Europeans accepted him fairly fast. We didn't. And um, so we had a lot of people that uh, died anyway. And one of the descriptions in this one is uh, one of the presidents who was, ex was shot. They did not know about it. They just kept sticking their fingers. I mean, they didn't know anything about cleaning your hands or whatever. And the surgeon would work on this patient and wipe himself on his gown and move over to the next one. Um, so this is how they finally beat the infection. Well, what, you know, obviously surgeons wanted to operate, doctors wanted, needed to operate on people, even just to say, save a leg or an arm or take it off. So what had been tried before we got ether? Well, you name it, if it made somebody go to sleep, it was tried. So opium, alcohol, mandrake is a sedative for it's been around. Uh, but there were two orientals, a Seisha, which was a Japanese surgeon, and the Q, who was a Chinese surgeon, who had some sort of formula that's never been exactly worked out uh, in which they would give the patient this medication and it would knock them out and they would be unconscious for anywhere from a day to several days. And while they were in the height of this unconscious period, they would operate on them. Um, that's never made its way into Western medicine, uh, but the, the, it's well documented <clears throat> that these two guys were successful in doing it. The other problem you got if you're giving somebody anesthesia, and this is again before ether, you had to give them the drug orally. And if you're unconscious, you can't swallow. So, you know, it was kind of hard to, you could give them a first dose, but the second dose was a little tougher. Um, the other thing was that small syringes had been around forever. Needles didn't become available until the 1850s. Uh, so you couldn't even inject the drug if you wanted to uh, until that time. What Napoleon's army used to do when they particularly invaded Russia, they say, okay, we got to take this guy's arm off because it's been shot away. Uh, they would freeze it. They just literally take him out in the snow and let him lay there till their arm went to sleep and then take it off. Even today, that is done in some cases, particularly after World War II, when we had a lot of soldiers that had uh, bullets still inside their heart or shrapnel or something physically inside the heart. In order to get a longer operating time, the doctors would lower the patient's body temperature down into the 70s. And that means instead of four or five minutes without oxygen, you could last 10 minutes without oxygen. And so they could do that. And the Russians still do this. Even in Korea, if you've read stories about the Chosin Reservoir and how cold and brutal that weather was, they left the soldiers out in the snow because their blood froze. They wouldn't bleed to death. And only when they were ready to actually work on them inside the tent would they bring them in and then the blow could start flowing again and they could handle the surgery. So cold has been used for a lot of reasons. But most surgery was done uh, only to treat injuries or perform amputations. We sometimes forget, you know, what things used to be like. You know, remember there were no automobiles as bad as they are today, but people used to drive those horse-driven carts 
hauling everything from store to store and place to place. And a lot of kids got run over by those carts and would have to have legs taken off or whatever. But to operate on the abdomen just couldn't be done unless something really peculiar happened. But even so, there were people called surgeons, but a busy surgeon would do four to five procedures in a month just because you could only do so much with no anesthesia. Sterile procedures come around in 1870. But it was said the germ therapy, which is this was developed in Germany, which is part of the way why it came from. Um, could, no matter how good a skilled job the surgeon did, you could still die from infection. I can even remember an orthopedic surgeon who said in the 1920s, they would take patients outside the hospital and operate on them, not only for the daylight, but also because there weren't any bugs for them to get infected with if they were outside in the parking lot. Um, so we were still fighting infections. I used to tell students I'm older than penicillin, you know, to put it into a perspective. Uh, penicillin was not available to the public in the, until 1946. Uh, it was available to the Army as early as 1943, but prior to penicillin, you know, it goes from there. So even though we had the anesthesia, that still did nothing to do for infection. Um, local anesthesia, the one which we've all had to get a cut soda up or whatever, came about from an ophthalmologist named Carl Kohler and Sigmund Freud was his assistant. Freud was experimenting with cocaine for his mental uh, disease problems. <laughs> and he found out that you got this uh, feeling of deadness. And he mentioned it to Kohler, who always wanted to operate on people's eyes, but it's kind of hard to get somebody to hold their eyes open, you know, when you bring them down and they can feel it. So he introduced Kohler to uh, cocaine and that's where the local anesthesia uh, things came in. Spinal anesthesia didn't even become practical in about 1898. That's a little bit of a knowledge of anatomy and also the, the materials you need to do with needles and syringes. And it really only became popular after 1920. Uh, before that, it was just that. What does ether mean? It has a lot of words if you look up a dictionary. It's sometimes space. Uh, anything above the atmosphere, or it's also the stuff that fills in everything in the, uh, and that we can see past the moon and the stars and the planets are all in the ether. Physics calls it an all-pervading, infinitely elastic, massless medium. There's something in the ether. Uh, it would be an example. Chemically, if a, if a compound has a structure C, carbon, oxygen, carbon, then that makes it an ether. And so as you see down in the bottom corner, that's ethyl ether, an ethyl group, C2H5, the oxygen, and another ethyl group. And it was once called sweet oil vitriol because if you see on the next slide, the way it's made is by using uh, two alcohols, heating that with sulfuric acid, and that then takes out one of the waters and turns it into ether. And so sulfuric ether meant simply alcohol heated with sulfuric acid to make ether. Paracelsus was a noted Swiss physician. And uh, this, since he was alive in 1540 when this was all taking place, and somebody thought, asked him if it had any medical use. And he gave it to chickens to see what to do as in the first of the animal experiments. And he saw that it had an anesthetic action, but he somehow or other didn't make the leap from putting the chickens to sleep to putting people to sleep you know, for the purpose of anesthesia. Um, so ether was well known um, 300 years before Long ever used it, uh, but nobody just ever came up with it. The very first gas it was suggested was carbon dioxide. And there was a guy, uh, Mr. Hickman, who did this with animal experiments, but he never tried it on people. And he would show that if you put a dog or a cat and having them breathe pure carbon dioxide, they would go to sleep because they can't get enough oxygen for their brain to stay awake. Um, but he died in 1830, and this was never really tried on humans. Nitrous oxide or laughing gas was synthesized in 1772. And since you could inhale it and so forth, it was almost recognized that it did relieve pain because people didn't uh, feel some of the pain and it also get giddy. Um, they tried it first in 1799 as an anesthetic, 
but they didn't, but it's not really that potent an anesthetic. And so they couldn't give the guy enough, you know, to withstand what they were doing to him. So they thought, well, no, it doesn't really work. It's a, a trick. Uh, so it provides some analgesia, but which means pain relief, but it doesn't provide anesthesia, which is total loss of sensation. And now, if you think about it recently, you've probably read about they're giving people pure nitrogen as a means of execution. The atmosphere is 80% uh, nitrogen, so we're used to breathing it all the time. But if you give somebody nothing but nitrogen to breathe, they're then finally deprived of oxygen, and it's the loss of oxygen that kills them, not the nitrogen. It was theoretically presumed that this would be a very... Uh, painless way to go, but it didn't seem to work that way when he actually did somebody in Alabama, what, a month, maybe two months ago. Um, so now there's, again, another great debate is, should we allow nitrogen as a way of uh, for anesthesia? But I can remember it, it being in New Orleans, then in the French Quarter, and going down the street, you could go into stores and you could buy you a little hit of nitrous oxide or laughing gas. So you'd go out on the street going, <laughs> You know, that Donald Duck type look, I guess, whatever. Well, once they find one gas, then they start looking for others. Um, so they're trying to find something better or as good as or just different. So they would synthesize a product and then they would get a bunch of people together and they would take turns inhaling it and seeing how well it worked. Uh, chloroform uh, was discovered in one of these, quote, scientific research meetings where everybody's about half drunk by the time they get it. It had been synthesized in 1831 in England, and it was uh, first used as an anesthetic in England on 4 November 1847, so they could take off somebody's leg. And the British surgeon that did that, you know, because they had just heard about what happened in Boston, in, which we'll get to in 1846, that's like a year ago, and they said, gentlemen, this is no Yankee Dodge. This stuff really works. So that's when we got modern inhalation anesthetics. And the ones that are used today are what are known as halogens. Uh, they're molecules filled with, with chemicals like fluorine, bromine, and chlorine, the halogens of one column on the periodic table. And there's a host of those things available. And uh, for example, halothane, the first one is no longer used. So that's what the ultimate goal was. But you did have to use the right gas because um, you could give somebody helium. There was one called cyclopropane that was great. It's a very simple chemical. It was easy to use, but it was also very explosive. It was an episode in Savannah where they were doing uh, taking out the tonsils and adenoids on a pair of twins. And I'm sure most of the people in this room were like me. Summer before the first grade, you went to the hospital and they took out your tonsils and adenoids. And so I remember like teaching class nowadays. I said, how many of you in here still have your tonsils and adenoids? Oh, wait a minute. Still have them, had them out. Ten hands out of a hundred would go up. I said, now, when I was your age in that time, you asked that question, how many people still have your tonsils and adenoids? And ten hands would go up. So it was there. But cyclopropane, uh, was very explosive. They had to keep the operating rooms cold. They had to keep them very humid. And they had an explosion in Savannah that killed a doctor, both patients, and a couple of nurses. So cyclopropane fell out of use um, due to those that kind of effective side effect. Okay, well, our boy Crawford, born in November 1st, 1815, in that house, which is still standing in Danielsville, Georgia, it's owned by an anesthesiologist from Atlanta. I guess that's only appropriate. He graduated from UGA with a master's degree in 1835 when there were like 90 students at UGA as a total enrollment. His roommate was Alexander Stevens, who was the future governor of Georgia and vice president of the Confederacy. And there is a plaque, and I don't know that it's been removed because of the reference to Confederacy or not. I haven't been on campus lately to look for it. But it's on the, if you're standing and looking at the old college with the city behind you, Main Street behind you, look up on the second floor, sort of on the far right of the building, it's where that plaque is because at that time, old college was a dorm. He taught school for one year before he went off to medical school because 
he's only 20 when he's graduated. And so his daddy thinks, well, you're too young to move away from home. So he kept him at home in Danielsville one, one more year. While he was there, he was studying medicine with Dr. Grant, who was in Jefferson. At this time in Georgia and in most of the country, most physicians got their training by as an apprentices to practicing physicians. And you studied for three years with a physician then you, and passed the state board, then you became a physician. Uh, it was the same for pharmacists. If you want to be a pharmacist, you went and studied for three years with a pharmacist and then passed the license exam. You're in business. He did spend one year in a medical school at Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky. But they, uh, it was a very leading medical school at the time. But part of the faculty decided to move over to Cincinnati and start another school. That started a big fight going on between everybody. And so the school actually closed as a result of that, which was why Long left and went to the University of Pennsylvania. Now, that's the University of Pennsylvania is the oldest medical school in the country. It was established in 1765. And at that time, it was the highest rated medical school in the country. The Medical College of Georgia was open. And I put two dates up there because like in many cases in the University of Georgia system, most schools have two dates. One is the date they were chartered. And the other one is the date they opened. So it was chartered in 1828, but it doesn't open until 1833. Now, UGA was chartered in 1785, but didn't open until 1800. So the 150th anniversary of the university and the, I'm sorry, and I'm sorry the, yeah, the 150th and the 200th anniversaries are only 35 years apart <laughs> because they changed from 1800 and went back to 1785. Um, so that's the way. But anyway, Long graduates in 1839 from, U, from Pennsylvania. And then he goes to New York and does what we would think of today as an internship or residency. He's there for 18 months in various hospitals. And after all that's over with in 1840, he comes back to uh, Jefferson and goes back into practice with the same guy he'd apprenticed with, Dr. Grant. Crawford Long on his statue, it says, my profession is a ministry from God. Uh, he was uh, very religious. He was one of the best trained doctors in the South. Uh, because um, even in the legitimate medical schools, there were still some of them only one and two years. So that in his case, uh, three years of medical school and a year and a half of externship, that was just unheard of. At the time, the Georgia Board of Physicians licensed both physicians and pharmacists. And the physician only had to tell the board that they wanted to be a pharmacist and they would give them a pharmacist license. And most physicians did that because for money, because if you were a pharmacist, you could buy the drugs you were gonna be dispensing and sell the drugs to people. And we'll come to a slide in a minute where Crawford Long and his brother are considered the leading druggist in Athens. They don't, it's not even mentioned that they're physicians in the ad. Uh, but anyway, it was a very common financial gain. We did get a board of pharmacy in 1881, but the physicians could still demand a pharmacist license and get it. But in 1889, they had to pass the pharmacy licensing exam to get one. And in January of 1934, they passed the law that you had to be a pharmacy school graduate in order to become a pharmacist. Now, the, uh, putting that law into effect was delayed three years to give people time to do that three-year experience before they had to be, come out of pharmacy school. Today, pharmacy school is anywhere from six to eight years, depending on where you go. And you get a degree called a doctor of pharmacy degree or PharmD. And there's also a practical experience requirement that varies from state to state. Okay, now Long's in Jefferson, set up with Dr. Grant. Within a year, he buys Dr. Grant's practice. And so he's now established in Jefferson for sure. In 1850, he thought it'd be a good idea to move to the metropolis of Atlanta, but that did not work out too well. So in 1852, he comes to Athens. He and his brother, who was also a physician, uh, they owned a pharmacy and practiced medicine. And as a one 1850s publication refers to him as Athens' leading druggists. <laughs> this is an ad 
from the one of the magazines from the Southern Banner, which was the main Athens paper at the time in 1854, showing or referring to him as wholesale and retail druggists. So he was a pharmacist. He owned at least two pharmacies during his career. It shows that uh, pharmacy was a significant part of their business. And there's still a Crawford W. Long Pharmacy in Jefferson. And it is a descendant of his Jefferson Pharmacy, and it's still in operation. Uh, the pharmacy in Jefferson is across the street from the Crawford W. Long Museum, which you'll shot of in just a minute. And just to show you about the money, this is the 1866 uh, income tax that Long paid. And Long and Billup, the second line, is the name of the pharmacy. And then you can see Long CW and Long RJR listed as positions below that. And you can see in the Long and Billup, in the first column, well, the second column, middle one, they paid $10. And then for the liquor business associated with it, they paid another $25. So he paid $35 in income tax from the drugstore, but only $10 in income tax as a physician, which shows a, an example of how he's making more money as a pharmacist and so forth else. And he was also the pharmacy preceptor for Joseph Jacobs, who was the owner of the pharmacy where the first Coca-Cola was served. So anyway, you can say Long was a pharmacist, you know, you can make that fit in. Where was it in Athens? It was downtown, just off the corner of College and Broad. If you're standing like basically in the UGA arch and looking across the street, it's that, I hope it's still blue, but anyway, it was when I took this picture. And he, his medical, his drugstore was downstairs. The medical offices were upstairs. Okay, now back to a little more history. Robert Boyle came up with what he called factitious or artificial airs. And James Watt, two names well-known in science, produced an apparatus so that you could inhale any gas, including nitrous oxide. There was a guy named Beddoes who was a physician who thought you could cure tuberculosis and other lung diseases if the patient could inhale nitrous oxide and enough of it. And it was found that the nitrous oxide would put someone to sleep if you inhaled it long enough and strong enough concentration. But it's not easy to make. You have to have a fairly good heat source, which up on the screen is represented by what looks like the rocket ship, but that's a Bunsen burner. Uh, and it would be used to heat a mixture of sodium nitrate and ammonium sulfate. And the chemical reaction that occurred released nitrogen, nitrous oxide. And that bubbled through a water bath and the water bath would catch some of the impurities in the gas. And then they had a cylinder that would catch the gas coming off and it was put into bags made either of animal bladders or airtight silk. So you would have this bag of nitrous oxide and that's what it would take to put one person to sleep, for example. Now, you connected a tube to the mouthpiece and people inhaled it so they could inhale it at laughing gas parties. Uh, that became popular in 1799. People got the giggles, they got euphoria, they erupted in laughter, as we sort of mentioned before. Davy, another famous chemist, believed that inhaling nitrous oxide would relieve pain, but it really didn't work in, for not, uh, the next 40 some years. It was tried for anesthesia. And Long got involved because he was asked to provide nitrous oxide for a laughing party in December of, 18, of 19, excuse me, 1841 but he didn't have the stuff he needed to make the gas. And he was familiar with sulfuric acid. He had attended ether parties during medical school and he'd hosted some in his early days in Jefferson. And he noticed that party goers would fall down and get hurt and not complain about the pain. One guy even dislocated an ankle, which should have caused just excruciating pain, but he didn't complain of any discomfort at all. And observing this happen is what gave Long the idea to use ether for anesthesia. Um, he also been well aware of ether parties because they were in Athens at least as early as 1832. There is a book written by a physician in Athens at that time who describes ether parties and what happened at some of them. He describes one in the home of a Mr. Ware in 1839 in which a young boy is given some ether to inhale and he just inhales a very heavy dose and just boom, he's down. 
And the people that gave it to him thought they'd killed him. And they kept trying to wake him up and he wouldn't wake up and he wouldn't wake up. So they get a doctor to come see him. Now you got to remember 1839 and where Mr. Ware's house was like 20 minutes from downtown Athens where Dr. Ware lives. I mean, where Dr. Reese lives. So they got to send somebody 20 minutes to get him, 20 minutes to get back, plus the time to saddle up the horse. So it's like an hour before the doctor gets there to see the patient. And uh, he stayed there, and it took him another hour just about to recover, but there was nothing wrong with him when he did. And one of those involved was a guy named P.A. Wilhite, who becomes a physician apprentice of Dr. Long in 1844. And so he described this incident to Dr. Long, even though this was after Long had already used ether for the first time. But it did help uh, solidify Long's belief in ether. Well, Long used ether to take a tumor off the neck of James Venable on Wednesday, the 30th of March, 1842. Venable had been one of the ether party players, so he was comfortable with this. Uh, Long didn't exactly publish this work in a hurry because he believed you had to have more than one example to prove something was working. And uh, he didn't have any real surgical practice. He would only see a surgical case occasionally, so he couldn't pile up patients very quickly. And so he didn't publish his use of ether until after he heard about the use of ether in Massachusetts in October, 1846. And we'll come to that. But that's the name of the, pa of the paper and he published it and notice it was published in December of 1849. So it's over seven and a half years after he's first used it that he actually puts it into print. There's an affidavit, there's a collection of affidavits that Long's Eldest, I'm sorry, youngest daughter uh, collected, and they're in a book that she published that is purchasable. Uh, this is the one from Mr. Venable, and it shows the uh, purchase of the ether. It shows the two surgeries. The dates are there. March 30th is clearly indicated, and he was charging him uh, $2 and two and, and for the ether and two fifty dollars for the surgery. Um, <laughs> And so this one and many other uh, examples of paper say, I had it done before they did it in Boston. That's what it comes down to. One of the things Long had to fight himself against was uh, hypnosis. There was a Dr. Franz Mesmer, and he had something called mesmerism. And I'm sure you've heard of somebody being mesmerized about somebody or something. And uh, Long wanted to be sure that what Ether was doing was, it wasn't as simply was Ether was in introducing a mesmer state. So that Ether was different from mesmerism. And the way he did that was to do some surgery with and some without Ether on, on the same patient. So he had a, a patient that needed two fingers amputated. He amputated one with Ether, one without Ether. And it was clearly the difference having the ether made in terms of the pain and discomfort of the patient. And then he had a lady that had to have three tumors removed. And he took the uh, one off with ether and the other two without ether. And her complaints and screams also made sure he said, okay, it's the ether that's working. So now Long is satisfied that it, that it does. Apparently, he's let people know this. He wasn't keeping it a secret. He told other doctors about it. And other doctors in and around Athens and Jefferson used ether uh, without knowing about what had happened, would happen eventually in Boston. This is a diorama that's uh, available at the Crawford W. Long Museum that shows how it was done. And Dr. Long is standing in front of the, the window, leaning over the patient to cut the, the tumor off his neck. This is the front of the Crawford W. Long Museum. It's in the same building that uh, Long had his Jefferson uh, medical practice in. So this is the actual site of that first surgery. It has a lot of uh, anesthesia collections, a lot of pharmacy stuff and so forth. Pretty good trip. I think it's, at one time it was free and you were asked to donate. Now I think they've actually had to put a charge on it to be able to afford to keep everything up. Okay, who besides Long had something to do and say that they did it? By luck, I was in Boston. My wife is originally from Boston. On October 16th, 2011, and I wanted to go to Mass General Hospital and see the site of what Mass General says was first ether. 
And that turns out to be Ether Day. And they had this great big dim, uh, display of stuff about Ether and Mass General Hospital. And this poster sort of puts it all together in one place. It does start out with Crawford Long at the top, and they do admit that he was the first to use it. But they still say, however, that Morton, the one down in the right corner, was the first public demonstration because when it was done in Boston, there were a lot of people present. It wasn't just a few people like in Jefferson. But the other uh, two people involved are Horace Wells, the one sort of in the middle of the picture, who was a dentist who tried nitrous oxide before anybody tried ether in Boston. And Charles Jackson, one of these characters from history, it's almost hard to believe. If he ran into somebody who had invented something, Jackson said he had done it first. <laughs> um, he had ether first. He had the telegraph first. He had uh, some mineral discoveries first and so forth. There is a hint in his biography that he had traveled from Boston to Alabama in 1844. Now, the train that you had to ride on went through Jefferson. And so it is possible that he was heard about Long and Ether in Jefferson on his way to and then back from Alabama. So who knows how, but he never admitted that. So who knows just how nefarious he got into it. But this is how everybody was digging in. At Mass General, I am not one of these warrants. Those are Mayflower warrants. I am a Virginia warren. Um, anyway, it has a building called the Warren Building, you know, which is kind of nice to go visit with your name tag on. Uh, honoring Dr. Joseph Warren. So when you go to Warren County, Warrington, and whatever else all through the country, about 50 to 60 places, that's who they're named after. That first guy on the left will show you a picture of why they're named after. Uh, and, and then Dr. John Warren was the father of Dr. John Collins Warren, who's the one that does the ether anesthesia in Boston. And then later on down the line, Dr. Jonathan Mason, Dr. another John Collins Warren, and then finally another, yet another Don, John Warren. And they have dioramas of the place at the same location. But the reason Dr. Joseph Warren is so well recognized is he was killed at Bunker Hill. Uh, and this is a famous painting of John, by John Trumbull, the death of General Warren at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And in addition to General Warren shown, just laid out here, back where the other arrow points is General Israel Putnam. And that's the man that Putnam County or Eatonton and so forth is named after. So there's two Georgia counties in the, that same picture. Now the Ether Dome is a green structure atop the Bullfinch building. Up on the upper left is the diorama to show it to you. On the right is the actual photograph of the current Bullfinch building with the green dome on top. And that's the original building of Massachusetts General Hospital. They always put operating rooms on the top floor because, hey, there's no walking over and flipping the switch. You know, this is before electricity. So they had to have daylight to be able to see. And so uh, having up where you get the daylight was always there. Now, in Boston, Horace Wells, Charles Jackson, and Morton were all trying some form of anesthesia. Wells and Jackson tried nitrous oxide for tooth extractions. And some people got it, it worked, some people it didn't. So it was not dependable. Uh, Jackson used ether to relieve the pain of accidentally inhaling chlorine gas that burned his throat. And opera singers used to in inhale ether uh, before performances so they couldn't get their throat too irritated. It would really relieve people from having pain from singing. I don't know if they still do that or not, but I've heard that from somebody who was an opera singer, minor league opera singer. <laughs> um, so I have to take her, her word for it. Um, <clears throat> Morton clearly heard about the use of ether from Jackson. So Wells tries nitrous oxide as a general anesthetic at Mass General in 1845, but it didn't work. The patients cried out. And so everybody said, oh, this is crazy, foolishness. And away it goes, nobody thinks to try nitrous oxide again. But Morton uses ether on Friday, that's the 16th of October, 1846. 
and Dr. John Collins Warren, who'd gotten his medical degree from the University of Edinburgh. And he's the grandson of our dead General Joseph Warren. And he was a co-founder of Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, by the way. Uh, and he removed a tumor from Gilbert Abbott's neck. It's almost exactly the same thing Crawford Long did, except Crawford Long's was from the back, his is from the front, uh, the difference. Now, Mass General was the third busiest surgical center in the U.S., but that was the only procedure scheduled for that day. Now, if you're the third biggest, that's probably one of them, 350 scheduled for that day. And the site is known as the Ether Dome. Now, this is a painting that's in the Ether Dome. It shows what was happening. And you know, the patient's in sort of white and everybody grabbing around him still and, and Warren is the heavily gray-headed, bearded man with him sticking his fingers out to cut the tumor off. Now, they redid this picture in 2011, uh, in which they took the current chairs of the surgical uh, groups at Mass General, put them into period dress, and reenacted the surgery. I doubt if they actually cut one off anybody's neck. But you can see these little structures that they're leaning forward on. And then if you step back, that's what they actually look like. They're sort of desk areas and so forth. And each chair in the ether dome has a plaque on it honoring uh, some well-known physician. And chair number one honors Crawford Long. Uh, so they are really admitting that, you know, he was first to do it, but we're the ones that showed how to do it first. So that's the way that battle went. What Morton did is he too took ether, but he added aromatic oils, especially orange oil, because he didn't want anybody to know it was ether. And since we said earlier, ether had been around for 300 years, surgeons knew ether. They knew ether to clean up wounds and everything else. So if he just used ether, they would have known what it was. They would have smelled it. They would have been familiar with it. And he called it Lethion. And he got that name from the uh, river in mythology, the Leith which once the dead souls crossed over the river Leith, they forgot their life on earth. And so they didn't have to be uh, punished or praised or whatever else for it. Uh, he used this, <clears throat> me, a special device to administer it. And that's the picture of it because they still have it in the ether dome. Uh, so he had a, a glass bottle with a hole that you could add more ether through. And there was a sponge inside where the ether would be soaked up. And then, um, the, sorry, the screen sharing kind of cuts it off, but a pipe ran from there and the patient inhaled through the pipe. Um, one of the problems that it had was that uh, the patient was only breathing ether. They were not breathing any air at the same time. And even if you've just watched TV shows, you know, when patients were getting surgery, they're giving them air and whatever gas they're giving them. So that, if you have to shut it off, the gas off real quick, they've still got something to breathe. Well, Long never tried to hide the fact that he was just using plain sulfuric ether. He didn't have a special formula. Uh, he also just simply put a towel over the patient's face and dropped the ether on it, which is basically the way they did it till they quit using ether. Mm -hmm. um, so the patient was breathing both air and ether at the same time, which is better for the patient. Now, there's always money to be made somewhere by somebody, by some means. Morton and Jackson both tried to get rich. They went into a battle to uh, get the money. Wells died in 1848. He was so totally depressed over the failure of that 1845 demonstration at Mass General that he was just basically a useless klutz for the rest of his life. And so he died before any of this battle could get started. Uh, he did get, Wells did get recognized. He was from Connecticut and Connecticut uh, gave him recognition as the first person to use anesthesia based on dental and nitrous oxide, but that's not surgical anesthesia. Jackson went to Europe saying, look what I did. Uh, we, I was first. Now, one place says Law and the other place says Morton. No place says Jackson except Jackson. Uh, France actually pays him and, and uh, for having suggested ether as an anesthetic and as a reward. And uh, he got most of his credit because his role was, and Morton rather, 
got most of the credit because his name was mentioned in the publications about the event. The publications did not mention Jackson or Wells. So uh, Morton was becoming, was given credit for being first. And we said earlier, Long hadn't published. Uh, and that's the reason most people don't want to give Long credit. But if he had published it, as soon as he did it, he would have gotten all the credit. But neither Wells, Jackson, or Morton ever published a word about it. Other people did. And the first report was the one shown in red there, uh, published by Henry Bigelow, who was one of the other founders of Harvard Medical School in the hospital. And that was published in 1846. And Dr. John Warren also later published an example. And uh, only Morton's name was mentioned in it. Morton tried to get a patent on Letheon, but he couldn't because he was still trying to not tell other people exactly what Letheon is. And, you know, if you get a patent, you can't have any secrets in it. So uh, that stopped that. They were going to give $100,000 to the discovery of anesthesia. Uh, Congress was going to do that. So then the arguing starts. Who was first? And that $100,000 then is $3 million today. Um, various committees and studies gave credit to either Wells, Jackson, or Morton. Nobody credited Long. Georgia's U.S. senators, when it got into Congress, said, wait a minute, this guy actually did it first. Uh, but everybody kept arguing and hollering, so nobody ever got any money out of it. That's the bottom line. Um, so anyway, though, when it all came down to it, um, Jackson admitted Long was first. Um, he actually came to Athens and said that. And when you when they unveil Long's uh, statue in the Capitol, as we'll show you later on, uh, Jackson made a statement that he knew that Long had been first. And Jackson was the only one still alive at the time to argue about it. And this is what that book of uh, doing it at the uh, Capitol. And it says, I have waited expecting Dr. Long to publish his statements that not published by learn from his very modest retiring man, not disposed to bring his claims before any but a medical or scientific tribunal. And if he'd written to him in, in early enough, I would have presented his claim to the Academy of France, but he allowed his case to go by default and they didn't know about his claims. That, and that's written 1861. So Jackson does agree. Now, incredibly enough, not all surgeons were willing to accept this stuff. Uh, religious beliefs at the time were a little severe. There is a line in Genesis, and there's a couple of other lines, where God says to Eve, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. So therefore, it was against God to relieve that pain of childbirth. So women were denied anesthesia. But then chloroform, as we mentioned earlier, gets used in November of 1847. It's the preferred agent in England and Europe. Queen Victoria uses chloroform in 1848 for the birth of her eighth child. She had nine. Um, and that all of a sudden did away with all the religious arguments. If the queen will use it, so can I. In the Mexican-American War, ether was available. Morton thought he should be paid two cents for every casualty who received ether uh, during the war. Uh, he wasn't paid. The British had both chloroform and ether during the Crimean War. Both ether and chloroform used by both sides in the U.S. Civil War. Ether and chloroform have one tremendous advantage over nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide, you got to have that great big bladder of gas. But both ether and chloroform, if you just open the cap on the bottle, they're liquids and they will vaporize at room temperature. So you don't have to, you can, one pint of ether would outweigh probably 25 bags of nitrous oxide. Uh, however, most uh, American surgeons never saw uh, bullet wounds. People just did not get shot. Uh, so unless they served in the military, uh, came the Civil War. If you read the uh, Southern Medical Journal, the South actually established panels of physicians to treat patients after each battle to determine what's the best way to treat that wound, that wound, and that wound, because they had no idea what was the right way to treat a wound. So they would have 20 surgeons look at everybody who got shot below the knee. They'd do this. Another 20 would do that. Then they determine the best way to treat somebody who'd been shot below the knee. 
Uh, it only takes about 10 milliliters, two teaspoonfuls of ether or chloroform to at least keep somebody, start them under anesthesia. You have to add more as you go along to keep them there. Neither chloroform or nitrous oxide are flammable. That's an advantage over ether. Uh, particularly, you got to remember, your light this, in this time of day and time is by candlelight or some other gasoline, uh, kerosene flame or something. And the wounds, they've got a thing here like a barbecue grill with iron stuck in it. So they need to stop a wound from bleeding. They pull out one of those hot irons and cauterize that wound. Now, fortunately, ether is heavier than air, so it settles to the floor. It doesn't rise up to the ceiling where it can be ignited by the lamps and so forth. But still, ether fires were a consideration. Ether and chloroform have different side effects. The main problem with ether is, is that when the patient's first going under, they're all kind of giddy and giggly and <laughs> before they actually go to sleep. Chloroform doesn't do that, but long-term use, chloroform is toxic to the heart and the liver. And so it came down to, there were physicians that says, ether's better. And I said, no, chloroform's better. And so that's still just going on. Finally, they did some animal experiments. They showed that chloroform causes cardiac fibrillation, and that's the way it damages the heart. And fibrillation is what kills you when you have a heart attack most of the time. Between 1865 and 1920, chloroform was the dominant use in, in, in Europe. But in 1934, they had compiled statistics and they showed that ether would cause a fatal, compli uh, fatal complication in between one in 14,000 and one in 28,000 applications. But for chloroform, the chance of a, of a toxic thing was in one in 3,000 and one in 6,000 patients. So it is, ether is roughly, uh, shall we say, 20% safer than uh, chloroform. And then by 1932, we were getting the new gas anesthetics, like the cyclopropane we already mentioned. Another one was trichloroethylene. We also got short-acting barbiturates. Phenobarbital is the classic barbiturate. And uh, they were useful to putting people to sleep. So chloroform finally just sort of began to fade away. How about getting along and uh, told you did a good thing? March 1912, the University of Pennsylvania issued this medallion on the 70th anniversary of ether use. And for a while, this medallion was at the museum in Jefferson. But I think the University of Pennsylvania took it back about five years ago. Um, another way along was been honored in 1921, Joseph Jacobs comes to graduation at uh, UGA and puts up a monument in Long's honor. Now the monument was first put at the, what was then called the main library. Today, that's the president's office on North Campus. But in 1964, when we built a new pharmacy building in South Campus, it was moved to the pharmacy building. So if you look at the maps, the one thing you can see on both, at the bottom of the one on the left is the stadium. The one on the right at the top of it, you can see the stadium. So that's the one thing that's easy to connect between the two. But that monument's just outside the pharmacy building's entrance. Did you even aware of that? Yeah, <laughs> I've seen it when I went to class, but I, it never, never made any difference. Yeah, I know. Well, March 30th is Doctor's Day. No parenthesis, I mean, uh, apostrophe. I didn't leave that out. That's what it's actually spelled. It was started in 1933 in Winder. Uh, a physician's wife started it, and it's now a national celebration day. Most hospitals recognize Doctor's Day on that day. 1920, Georgia established Long County, which is down in south, southeast Georgia. Uh, Ludowisi is the county seat of, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, Ludowisi used to be the world-famous speed, speed trap. trap. There's six counties in Georgia that are named after physicians, and it's uh, Banks, Hall, Bibb, and Terrell, and then Warren and Law as well. Crawford Long Hospital in Atlanta was not built to honor Crawford Long. It was built by two other guys. And then in 1931, they named it Crawford W. Long. But since Emory bought it, it's been renamed to Emory Midtown. And uh, But the name of, and the original building are still standing. And so that's still over there. This is Long's statue that's in the U.S. Capitol Statuary Hall. 
I know that right now there's a great movement. Anybody that ever owned a slave is thrown out of the Capitol, and I don't know if this has been changed or not. It was there uh, last summer. Huh? We were there last summer and took a picture of it. So it's still there, okay. And in 1840, or 1940, they came out with stamps honoring famous Americans. And so they issued a two-cent stamp, uh, which in 1940 would deliver a letter anywhere in the United States um, in honor. And I've got a couple of those, but that's what the stamp looks like. He got a Coke bottle named after him. Uh, 1992, the 150th anniversary, when they had a big thing about that. And you can actually go to Crawford W. Long um, Museum and buy one of these Coke bottles. You may have to buy six, but anyway, you can buy them. Um, still, if you read medical stuff, you'll find a lot of stuff still says it was Morton. I did it on AI just to see what would happen in November 2023, and it came back that Morton was first. So uh, despite the fact that all of the world seems to admit it, there's a lot of people still just can't believe it. I remember in Scientific American, the author said, at least since October of, tw of uh, 1846, so therefore, at least since then, didn't say it couldn't have been before them, but that author did not contribute it to, long, to uh, Crawford Long. He operated on Doc Holliday. Doc Holliday was actually a cousin. Uh, Doc was born with a cleft palate. I know you've all seen people with a scar down through here. And what happens is you're becoming as yourself in utero is the two sides of your mouth grow together and close to make your arch, which is why you can see that kind of crease if you look up under there, right? And if that doesn't close up, then you get an opening in here and that's called a cleft palate. And that was a real issue in the 1800s. Uh, so Dr. Long was called to close that palate up and he did. And after that, uh, Doc had to be fed nothing but liquids and they used a shot glass so they could control the, uh, and I don't know if that had anything to do about him being a heavy drink drinker, be trained to drink out of a shot glass only. But he also did become a real dentist. He, that's not something made up. And I know he's most famous for the gunfight at the OK Corral. But anyway, Long protects medicine, pharmacy in Athens. He treated rich and poor, free and slave. There's a, a collection of information called the slave narratives that would go by state by state and county by county. Long had the belief that slavery was God's method of making Africans become Christians. Um, his daughter put that in her, in her biography of her father, which is where I got that line. Uh, never heard that one before, but anyway. Uh, he was a member of a Civil War home unit. He was never on active service. He was a Confederate States medical officer in Athens. Athens was where many wounded soldiers were brought back from the front and, and kept soon as the war was over, the federal government made him the medical officer for Athens. So he served for both groups. He also got a land grant when they were giving away the Cherokee lands, but then he lost it. That's what that advertisement says. And it's really kind of interesting is if you look at the uh, land grant, that, the full description, uh, the numbers uh, 162 and 612 get transcribed in it. So it's a... Uh, in the first couple of lines, it says lost in Hancock County, land warrant number 3612. And then down underneath that, it says under number 162. So who knows which one it actually was. This is something I've found a lot of people don't fully understand. Average age of death. They'll hear that the average age of death was, in this case, 42 and a half years. That means they think everybody... Nobody lived past 42 and a half. You know, you got 43, you're lucky. But what it actually is, is you take everybody in your family or everybody out of a group and you add them all up and divide by the right number. So this is Long's family. Long himself and his wife and then his children. And notice there are four children with a one. Uh, now you've got probably the best trained doctor in Georgia here. And he's still having kids die, you know, because there's another nine in there as well. But if you add them up and divide them by the right number, the average age of death is 42 and a half years. And that was the average age of death in 1860 in the United States. Mm -hmm. So having a physician for a father didn't make a lot of difference. <laughs> when he died, he died from a stroke, um, 16th of June, uh, 1878. He was 62, he delivered a lady's ba uh, baby. 
and then just had a stroke in her uh, living room and died. Mm -hmm. uh, his last word was somebody be sure and take care of the lady. Uh, he knew he'd been the first to use ether, although there'd been all the battles and everything that went, went on and about it. Uh, he's buried in Oconee County, you know, Oconee Hill Cemetery, the one that's across the street from the, from the football stadium, as are most of the rest of the members of his family. So uh, you can, and that's the actual tombstone for him and his wife. Well, if it wasn't for anesthesia, there wouldn't be much surgery because what anesthesia does is live, give a surgeon time to do with them what they need to do. And the patient's not, doesn't have to be controlled to do that. Um, Dr. Warren said it's no humbug. The yeah, British surgeon mentioned before, it's no, uh, no dodge, beats mesmerism anyway. So even though other people came up with the same ideas Long did, Long was still first. And under any circumstances, it's made surgery a much more tolerable position today. But neither ether or chloroform is used today. They're both gone. The last use of ether anesthesia at Mass General was 20 December 1979. There is a book the history of, about the history of Massachusetts General Hospital, and it's entitled Something in the Ether. Um, that's the way of getting that one. Just for general information, in case you get caught up with the terminology from somebody, today we call an anesthesiologist is a physician, and they have been trained in, additionally in anesthesia, just as a cardiologist is trained more in the heart. They supervise everybody else, and they can even specialize themselves. You can be a pediatric anesthesiologist, for example. CRNA is a term you don't, term you don't hear as much as you used to. It's certified registered nurse anesthetist, and it were nurses, after they finished nursing school, were then uh, specifically trained to administer anesthesia because there was more need for anesthetics than there were for anesthetics people doing the anesthesia than there were physicians to do it. And so you might have a hospital to have one or two physician anesthetics, physician anesthesiologists, and then five or six nurse anesthetists who would work under their supervision. Nowadays, it's mostly physicians, assistants, and nurse practitioners. And that is one of the uh, career directions they can take for their specialty. And then there's usually an anesthesia technician who just helps set everything up and do it, but has no official, I guess, they're, they're trained, but they don't go to the same level. What do they use to put you to sleep? Well, the term general means it puts you to sleep. Local means that it deadens pain in a certain area, but you can remain awake while it's happening. Um, the gases that are used this day and time um, are the fluorines, desfluorine, isofluorine, sevofluorine, there are many others. Pancuronium is a drug that's used to relax your muscles. Even though you're asleep, your muscles will still tense and move while they're operating on you if they don't give you, give you one of these. And so pancuronium is used for that, is one of the things used for that purpose. And we have a lot of general anesthetics that are not gases, they're uh, liquids that are infused IV and they work. And, uh, four of the big ones there, etomidate and then fentanyl or sufentanyl. And that's the very same fentanyl that's the big drug uh, overdose problem chemical. And then ketamine is another chemical that's also found a lot of other uses. They're finding even now that it can be used in the depression and so forth. And then propofol looks like a jug of milk hanging up there. And that's the one that Michael Jackson was using to go to sleep. And finally, I guess, gave him too much self too much when it got him. We also have the barbiturates and the benzodiazepines, quote, tranquilizers to many people. But thiopental and methohexatal, the ones that you get a dose of that. And that's like in the old movies where it's now start counting back from 99, 99, 98, 99. You know, <laughs> that was the barbiturate. And then midazolam and lorazepam can give it to you to help calm you down, maybe even in some cases, some minor surgery. Midazolam is called dazzle when it's being abused. And um, it will actually uh, make you forget whatever happened. Uh, so you, you might call to the hospital at five o'clock in the afternoon and say, Dang, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to be over there this morning. You were. Unbutton your shirt and look. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it'd be that bad, but anyway, still. 
the local anesthetics or the canes, and they're available in about any version you can come up with. You can use them for local just to sew up a cut. Uh, they can put them in what is called epidural or spinal, and that will block the pain down below that. Uh, anywhere you're getting problems with your from your neck all the way to your rear end, uh, spinal anesthesia can take care of part of it anyway. This one, Procaine, if you make this little a H2N a slightly different thing, it becomes an antiarrhythmic and can stop cardiac arrhythmias. So just minor chemical manipulations sometimes can change the drug totally. There's other agents. Anticholinergics are used to keep you from forming spit so that you have a dry mouth. And But they also are the ones that shut down your GI tract and your bladder so that you typically won't be allowed to go home until you've had a bowel movement or urinated to prove that the anticholinergic is worn off. Uh, but literally any drug you can come up with with a sedative action has been tried for anesthesia one way or the other. Pain, the actual pain pills, painkillers, everything from acetaminophen on up again is used to control postoperative pain. Um, and the unfortunate thing is almost all of these things can be uh, abused. Uh, and most are to some extent, uh, more some more so than others. So I'll be glad to take any shots. Lynn, I remember when I had my tonsils out, my sister had tonsillitis, chronic tonsillitis, so, you know, two for one, I guess. So I had to have mine out too. And I remember they put a little screen over your like ether. A, they would be yeah, and then they sprinkled ether and that was, oh, that was horrible. The spell. It threw up for hours after that. Yeah. That's what I remember about it. Mm. Yeah. I call it Mickey Mouse perky. I had my tonsils out at Crawford Long. <laughs> <laughs> It's full dose. <laughs> the infection with the surgery, did Crawford Long, how did he, did he buy into the lack of cleanliness that led to infection? So he actually was dead by the time that had come to, to be an issue, oh. uh, or at least enough of an issue for him to have to make a decision on it. Because Lister started in 1870 in Europe and he didn't bring it to the United States until like 1890. Mm -hmm. Now, forgive me if I'm missing five years on that one way or the other. Um, by then it was well publicized in Europe. There was a, another doctor by the name of Semmelweis who was an Austrian. And what he proved is that if the doctor washed his hands between, in this case, pregnant women uh, or women in, that he was seeing, it would greatly reduce the infections that occurred in that particular unit. So Semmelweis, a little bit before East uh, Lister, got everybody to start washing their hands and change coats between patients. Um, but Lister's the one that brought the idea. And what he had, he had a device that actually blew phenol gas across the operating field. And uh, that would then kill any bugs that might get in the way. One of the reasons doctors started wearing gloves and masks is because they're in here working with it and they're inhaling that phenol as well. And it would irritate their hands and it would also irritate their lungs. So putting gloves on kept your hands from getting irritated and the mask kept you from inhaling it for your lung problems. Now, later they figured out, <laughs> you know, it also meant you weren't spreading bugs on the patient. So it became more, more calm. But I think it was a specific nurse that figured out the one about the gloves and, and started that one for the phenol. But uh, I'm trying to remember. Okay, Lincoln was first. Who was the next president? Garfield. When Garfield was shot. Andrew huh? Johnson, after Lincoln? Yeah. Andrew Johnson. No, he was the president. The next one to be assassinated was Garfield. Oh, okay. Anyway, when Garfield was assassinated, the doctor that worked on him was convinced. Now, that, again, there's no x-rays. <laughs> you know, you kind of got to do everything as well as you can. And so they would probe to try and see where the bullet was. They knew where it went in. They just didn't know where it had lodged. They had assumed if it went in about here, it's lodged up here. In fact, it had ricocheted off a couple of things. It was actually over here. So they're over here sticking their fingers in the wound and sticking their fingers in the wound. And they're used to, and pus 
you know, which we've all seen some pus, even you just pop a little something on your arm. Well, there used to be what was called laudable pus, which meant that that pus wasn't going to kill you. Now, I'm not sure how that definition was separated totally, but they thought he was having laudable pus. But they introduced so much infection to him, and he lived over 30 days going through all this. The pus that drained out of him actually weighed more than the rest of his body did yeah. when he died. Yeah. Um, and um, so this surgeon became famous for the doing infamous, that's a better term, for the, for the way he treated and the, just left, basically killed the guy. I'm not saying he's gonna, he would have lived anyway, but he definitely facilitated his death. So he died of sepsis then. Yeah, he died of sepsis. And so it was about 1900 before Americans started accepting this European innovation of the, of the phenol uh, gas. And you got to remember, again, penicillin, 1946, first real antibiotic we had. It was sulfur drugs in the 35, but they weren't that good. Now, they were good compared to nothing at all, which was the status before that. But, um, you know, they've, they've tried arsenic. They've tried mercury. Um, other things like to treat syphilis. Um, and there's no evidence that any of it ever made any difference at all. Uh, the people took it. Um, I remember some, they were excavating a uh, cemetery here in the Athens area, and we opened up one of the uh, caskets, and there were bottles of tablets in there. We took them over to the pharmacy school and assayed them. They, they contained uh, silver, and they contained um, arsenic. Now, silver does actually work as an antibiotic, so to speak, there's silver sulfidizing cream the surgeon may give you to rub on a cut or a wound and so forth. And there used to be, when you were all born, you got silver nitrate eye drops mm -hmm. to keep you from picking up an infection and being born through your mother's birth canal. And, um, and me too. Um, so that uh, it's silver's well known, but it's just, you can't drink silver. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way. It's only good topically. Mm -hmm. Sure. First of all, thank you thank for the great presentation. Just building on this, anecdotes during the First World War, less than half of the surgeons, military surgeons, believed in the germ theory. It just shows you how long it takes for some of those ideas to come in. Yeah. But if you were to extend it for anesthesia, how would it take, can we ask how long it took from 1844 to a generalized use of anesthesia. Anesthesia, anesthesia was much quicker. Uh, once they got chloroform in England and once they got it spread out in Boston uh, in a year, two years at the most, anesthesia was, uh, uh, except for OB, took a, little, a couple more years. But uh, by 1850, it was everywhere. Nobody was doubting its, its benefits because it was really what was holding medicine back in terms of Surgeons have an old statement. You can't cut it out. If you can't cut it out, you can't cure it. And that's pretty well true. You know, try to name a disease we've ever cured out of existence. Only one pops up to some minds of smallpox, and we did not cure that out of existence. We vaccinated it out of existence. We didn't even get a treatment for smallpox until about 10 years ago. 35, 40 years after we eliminated it. Well, and that treatment was never tested on anything but animals because you can't ask somebody to catch smallpox. <laughs> You're a test subject. Yeah. Everybody wants to have the smallpox over there. Everybody who doesn't over here, don't get trampled. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, totally off the line, but pissing with smallpox. You know, they were still vaccinating people for smallpox in the late 70s uh, because they didn't declare it to beaten until 1980. And when my kids and my family and I went to Saudi Arabia, my children, who at the time were four and 10, had to get smallpox shots because they weren't doing that in schools after you know our age, basically. And, um, and then I'd gone on a trip down to Yemen, one of the joke countries of the world. And we're coming back across the border and the, the border was nothing except two tents and two card tables. <laughs> but one of them was um, 
vaccinations, and one of them was, are you carrying any contraband? And so the vaccination tent, this guy had a tray full of smallpox needles, which if you've ever seen one, looks like a two-time fork, you know, and they make punctures. And then, and then they drop the vaccine on top of that. And if you've traveled internationally, you may have a yellow book that has all of your uh, immunizations listed in it. I was so happy I had mine when I looked at that tray. I said, I've already had my smallpox shot. Because by then I was in my 40s and, I was, and the, you know, the, the uh, circle had gone away basically by then. I've not seen anybody had one of those circles except my two sons, <laughs> you know, in quite a while. So it, funny things can come up in a lot of funny ways. Well, if you come back next week, it'll be crawl, it'll be uh, Asa Candler, and we'll start out with some more about Asa's background as a person. And then most of the time will be spent on how he made Coca Cola a success that it is, and then how he how he sort of personally funded Emory, uh, un the university we know it. If you're enough been in Georgia long enough to know, there's Emory College in Covington, which is the original site of Emory. But that was a college, not a university. And Emory needed a university. The Methodists needed a university. And so they wanted to put it in Atlanta where everything would be bigger. But you can't be a university if you don't have an undergraduate college. So Emory College agreed to be the undergraduate for Emory University. But Emory University was founded totally separately from Emory College or Emory at Oxford, as it's known now. Uh, it, it, it never moved. Emory at Oxford is still right where it was from day one. Asa Candler, Coca-Cola man. And then after Asa Candler, we'll do Ray Alquist, who nobody can spell except me when I'm in the And um, And then finally, Agatha Christie and the drugs, which is probably the most popular one of all. I, I thought there was the Coke branch and then the theology branch. I thought that there was the, 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 what you're thinking of school is, theology. Is this will be more done better then? The Methodists had to have a university in which to train their pastors. They had been using Vanderbilt. The Vanderbilt got the money and they decided to go non sectarian. I'm not sure they meant to go, you know, all religions, but at least they meant to. So not the not just the Methodist school. SMU, Southern Methodist University, got founded in Texas, but they needed one in the Southeast. So Howard Candler, Asa's brother, was the chief bishop of the Methodist Church in the South. So he convinces Asa, who has the money, you know, to help us found Emory University. And then they talked to the people that had Emory college and said, well, what, help us find a university. I talked to people at Emory College, will you be our undergraduate unit? They said, yes. I said, okay, if you're in the undergraduate unit, we'll call the university Emory University. And that's how I got that name. Isn't Emory at Oxford just a two-year school? Isn't that one now? Isn't it a two-year school? No, the Emory at Oxford is two years. Yes. And if you go, go to Emory at Oxford, and graduate, then you're automatically accepted at the Emory in Atlanta for your junior and senior years. Okay. I've got enough people in the family that have done that. But <laughs> back to the latest one is graduating this year from Big Emory. Some people call them Little Emory and Big Emory. Okay, well. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, there's a way to shut this down. Ah. My, one of my assistants. I was in the retirement industry it was Dorothy Candler, who was part of the, the theology yeah. side of the calendar. Yeah. And she told me, she said, we were talking about, I was telling her that I visited Peg Wall's paper because my wife 
And she said, well, I don't think what to do. She said, just make me some of lashes in the wallpaper and then I'll stuff put the book out and let it sit there for about four days. <laughs> and then he and then she could work that hope. And it's on flat for four days. Work it in there. She said it'll dissolve all that taste. Probably did. Said, I said, Dorothy, I said, she said, and yeah, we're drinking, but think about it. And she laughed and she said, but she said, it works. And yeah. I, after that, I thought, I thought that was funny that a candle would share that it would take wallpaper off. Well, there's lots of good stories about oh, uh, huh? candlers and Woodruff's and yeah. Coke and Pepsi. So. <laughs> so, I, I, I It was so good. I mean, yeah. I'm an old retired nurse. It was okay. just good. terrific. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Who was it that graduated from Avery? Well, Bonnie's daughter. Uh -huh. um, and